This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is brought to you by Black Star Renegades, a new novel by Michael Morisi. Kirkus Refuse writes, A propulsive space opera that is also an unapologetic love letter to Star Wars. Impossible not to love. From intergalactic space battles to blaster fights to rogue robots and various hives of scum and villainy, this shiny space opera is bound to be a pleasure for fans of all stripes. Learn more over at michaelpmorisi.com. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 288 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing the new Fox TV series, The Orville. And this will include spoilers for the entire first season, so just be aware of that. And I'm joined by three guests. So first up, we've got our producer, John Joseph Adams. He's the editor of Lightspeed and Nightmare Magazines, and he also oversees John Joseph Adams Books, an imprint of Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. He's the series editor of The Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy, and he's also edited many other books, including anthologies of outer space adventure like Cosmic Powers and Federations. So, John, welcome back. Always good to be here. Then next up, we've got Melinda Snodgrass, who you may remember from our panel on The Magicians back in episode 199. She's the author of many novels, including the recent books The High Ground and its sequel in Evil Times. And she's also written scripts for TV shows like The Outer Limits and Sequest DSV. Her Star Trek The Next Generation script The Measure of a Man has been voted as one of the 10 best Star Trek scripts of all time. Together with George R. R. Martin, she edits the Wildcard series of Shared World Superhero Anthologies. And she's currently serving as the executive producer on the upcoming Wild Cards TV series from Universal Films. So, Melinda, welcome to the show. Thank you, David. Happy to be here. And also joining us today is Robert Rapino. He's the author of the novels Mort, Dark, and Cul-de-Sac, about a post-apocalyptic war between humans and uplifted animals. And his short fiction has appeared in literary journals such as Night Train, Word Riot, and The Furnace Review. He teaches at the Gotham Writers Workshop, and is also a frequent contributor to Tor.com, with articles like Now is the Perfect Time for a New Star Trek Series and Why is Westeros So Effed Up? By day, he works as an editor for the Oxford University Press. So, Robert, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Good to be with you. And today's show is brought to you by Black Star Renegades, a new novel by Michael Morisi, author of critically acclaimed comic book series like Rosh Limit and Burning Fields. His work has been published with Image Comics, Boom Studios, Vertigo, Black Mask, IDW, Heavy Metal, and more. And he's also written about Star Wars for outlets like StarWars.com and Tor.com. And here's a description of the book. It says... He didn't ask for it, he doesn't want it, but if he can't figure out how to use the galaxy's ultimate weapon, everyone's totally screwed. Blending the space operatics of Star Wars and the swagger of Guardians of the Galaxy, Black Star Renegades is a galaxy-hopping adventure that blasts its way from seedy spacer bars to sacred temples guarded by deadly creatures, all with a cast of misfit characters who have nowhere to go and nothing to lose. Legendary comic book writer Grant Morrison calls the book, Epic space adventure with big, bold characters, exotic new worlds, and a rocket ride of a plot that rips along at plus warp speed, delivering one dizzying twist and turn after another. If you love Star Wars, Guardians of the Galaxy, or classic pulp science fiction, Black Star Renegades dazzles like an exploding star. And John Jackson Miller, author of Star Wars A New Dawn, writes, Engaging and inventive twists on a much-loved genre, a fun ride for space opera fans. So again, the book is called Black Star Renegades by Michael Morisi, and you can learn more over at michaelpmarisi.com. All right, so now let's get to our panel. Okay, so my understanding is that this show, The Orville, came about because Seth MacFarlane is a really big Star Trek fan, and he just wanted to make a Star Trek-style show with him as the captain, sort of the ultimate fantasy for any hardcore Star Trek fan. And since he's the creator of Family Guy and had made Fox a gazillion dollars, they were kind of like, nah, all right, <laughs> give it a shot. <laughs> You know, I don't think anyone else would uh, would have been allowed to make this show, but uh, but since it was Seth MacFarlane, he was able to do it. And um, I know, John, is there anything else I should say about this show? What do you think about the anything? Do you know anything else about the origins of this show? Uh, no, I mean uh, that 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 was what I assumed. I hadn't actually done any research into it, but I mean, what you just described is what I assumed happened. Yeah. Well, George is actually a pretty good uh, friend with Seth, and uh, he ha basically had blind pilot agreements. He could make hmm. anything he wanted, um, three shows that were absolutely his. And 
he's always wanted to play Captain Kirk, you know, mm-hmm. to be a version of Captain Kirk, and he finally got his his opportunity. Oh, that's great. So we got some inside info here. So, mm-hmm. Melinda, did you, know, did you know anything else? Any more juicy no, details a, about the origins no, of this that's part? All that, that's all that I know thus far is, uh, is, is that information. So. Uh-huh. Well, I guess we should say that this is, it's not exactly Star Trek, but it's pretty close. Um, <laughs> the only real difference that I sort of came to me is that they don't have the uh, transporters on right. the Orville. But otherwise, it's pretty much exactly the Star Trek universe. Um, do you agree with that, Robert? Are there any, any other differences I'm not seeing here? Yeah, I was I was going to say the transporters myself, and yeah, that seems to be the only difference. I mean, even the similarities similarities are even to the point where you know you're just using stand-in words for you know for instead of Federation, it's the Union. Mm-hmm. Instead of the Klingons, it's the Krill. So yeah, it's it's actually hard at this point to really point to the. Uh, the differences and they, they have the prime directive basically i mean they don't call it that exactly but same yeah. exact idea i was actually thinking that the klingons were more analogous to the Mocklin. like i just like that guy th- they seem more like klingons to me but um but i guess the krill makes sense also since they're an antagonist i felt like the krill were uh original series klingons yes and the Mocklin were next generation klingon the more right, mellow right, klingon. Right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Totally. Suddenly they had the turtle head Klingons. Right. Um, I mean, the differences I see, uh, having written for Next Generation, is is just the complete difference in tone. Mm-hmm. And I would be, I would desperately love to write for the Orville. It was everything that we weren't allowed to do on Star Trek. There's humor. There's actual emotion. I feel like these people like each other and like they are dislike each other and actually have relationships. So that's where I see the strong differences. Well, yeah. In terms of the personalities of the crew there's a difference for sure i mean and also not just in terms of their um friendliness but also their competence i mean this is a mm-hmm. there's a mm-hmm. much a huge uh variation variability in competence on the part of the uh the orville crew yes absolutely and um i, I mean i just find it charming i mean when uh when the helmsman asked if he could have a Coke with him at his, at his station, mm-hmm. I was just, I, I, that was when that show absolutely won my heart. Well, it was interesting. I was, I listened to a few interviews with producers of this show and they were saying that those there, cause there are a lot of like the Coke, there are some, a lot of sort of contemporary society sorts of uh, jokes mm-hmm. and references and pop culture references and things. And um, he was saying that this, uh, that those, drive some of the more hardcore science fiction fans crazy because like why would people in mm-hmm. hundreds of years in the future still be talking about friends or whatever it is um but that he felt that those were important to bring non-science fiction fans into the show that you know mm-hmm. that allows the the sort of more casual viewers to connect with the characters and then you know then they can sort of sneak the science fiction out uh, the more sort of thoughtful science fiction stories to those audience once, once they pull them in with something familiar mm-hmm uh, one of the things that uh, that struck me about the show was that, uh, you know, hearing you describe like how Seth MacFarlane just always wanted to make a Star Trek show, it, it, it's very obvious when you're watching it that that's the case. And it almost seems to me like, like, I don't know how it played out, but I mean, I it almost seems to me like he wrote all the scripts and wrote them exactly like he would write a Star Trek script. And then a lawyer from the studio came in and I'm like, hey, you know, in order for us to legally be able to do this, you need to make it a parody. So you need to add more jokes. And Seth MacFarlane's like, well, I know I'm a joke guy, but, you know, I don't really want to put jokes in here. And the, but the lawyer is like, you know, no, 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 you have to put jokes in there. It's got to be it's got to be a parody. Otherwise, it's copyright infringement. And Seth was just like, all right, I'll add some jokes, you know, because it's like it, it kind of feels like some of the, a lot of the jokes are kind of phoned in where it's like it's like they obviously put a lot of attention into writing like a, a, a script. That's very much like a Star Trek script. Um, but then the, the, a lot of the jokes, it's like, oh, OK. I mean, that's not really a joke. That's just like <laughs> kind of a weird it's kind of a weird contemporary reference, like you were saying, Dave, or 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 just like sort of uh, uh, a very informal comment that is incongruous with the setting that they're in. And so it's like kind of a joke, but not really. Um, <laughs> so. So, yeah, I don't know. It's kind of funny to me. I mean, I, I'm kind of baffled that it is that this is legal that they're allowed to do this because it's like, it's barely a parody, 
you know and like you said it's so exactly star trek <laughs> that like you could like you could take the orville ship and put it in the in an episode of next generation and nobody would blink i mean it's like yeah the, the design is slightly different but not not so much more different than like the voyager ship versus the enterprise for instance it's like it, it would match well enough so um that that's been my big confusion with the show is that like i'm i'm astonished that it's legal <laughs> Yeah, I would. Can I just uh, just jump yeah, in yeah, real quick? Ahead. The the um, well, thing the thing about the jokes that was interesting for me was that the um, in the early episodes in particular, a lot of the scenes seemed ready to end, and yet hmm. there was sort of a joke tacked on at the very end of it, just because I, I it almost felt as if the people making the show didn't want to let the that's that moment go, so they there had to be a an awkward moment or a or a pun or or a, a pop culture reference or something that I felt like as the show went on they they sort of lost the sort of need to do that but I felt in the first few episodes in particular there were a few of those moments where it's like okay let's move on to the next scene guys and they they still felt obligated to throw in a you know a, a poop joke well well let me ask Melinda what do you think about what John's saying that this is so close to Star Trek perhaps even in a potentially legally dangerous waters kind of way. Do you, do you have any perspective on that as a, you know, I, I don't think I see it that way. I mean, I used to be a lawyer before I became a writer. I mean, uh, you know, is this an infringement? I mean, at this point, I don't think Paramount wants to get in a big fight with Fox a and B. I think they probably aren't sorry that there's something that's actually feels more Star Trek mm -hmm. than discovery right mm -hmm. now. And so, um, I'm not sure that this doesn't help their brand because what I'm hearing is that that discovery is not exactly winning hearts here. Um, I admit I only watched the first episode that was free and, you know, rolled my eyes and said, nah, I'm not going to pay $9 a month for CBS All Access. I'll wait till it's on Netflix and see if it's, you know, then binge the thing. I just don't think it gains them anything to get into a big battle um, against against Fox and against McFarlane, who's very popular. And I think it's actually, I mean, I know speaking for myself and I know several other people who worked on Trek, for us, it's, it's you know, it's regret. We wish that we could have done some of the things that, that they're getting to do. And yes, the jokes, sometimes the jokes fall flat and, and they don't work. But again, I have a very strong sense of these people and I like them and I like to spend time with them. I mean, television is ultimately company. And you're inviting these people into your living room once a week or, or, or perhaps binging three or four episodes at a time. If you're going to spend time with them, you have to like them. And I think that they've done a beautiful job of creating interesting people. And the other thing I have to say in, in McFarland's favor is that he is very generous with the shows. If you notice that everybody has their moment in the sun, George and I were talking about it because he, he watches the show and we text each other after it's over. And, and the fact that he's willing to allow an episode to focus on one of the more minor characters is, is something you don't often see. And it was, it was quite refreshing. And, and it gave these people an opportunity and created that sense that this is a community and I like the community. Well, it's interesting when you say that about um, Star Trek Discovery, it kind of makes me think of the original series episode where Kirk gets split into the good Kirk <laughs> and the bad Kirk. And it's mm -hmm. almost like you, it almost feels like that's happened with Star Trek that, you know, it got split into light Trek and dark Trek and dark Trek is Star Trek Discovery and light Trek is the Orville. <laughs> interesting approach. Yeah, I guess that could be seen that way. Oh, and you know, just to just to clarify, I wasn't suggesting that that Paramount should sue anybody. I'm just, I was just saying that it's like, it seems to me from like somebody who has to, you know, make a judgment on things like this on occasion, like when a writer writes something that is, uh, you know, riffing on some existing um, property, it was like. I would be very, I would have been very concerned that it was crossing a line, that it wasn't actually far enough into parody that, that they wouldn't have a case. And I mean, it's possible that they are fine with it, but I was just thinking that like, well, if they were so inclined, I feel like they probably do have a case if they wanted to make an issue of it. But I mean, I totally get what you guys are saying. And then I totally agree that Orville feels actually much more like Star Trek, explicitly uh, Star Trek Next Generation than Discovery does by a long shot. Um, and I do enjoy the show and I agree with what Melinda is saying about like, I, I like the characters, even if, uh, you know, even, even for, you know, I have quibbles about all different things, but, um, 
but I mean, yeah, like I, I generally like the characters and I have a good time in, in, in enjoying the show, um, which is not necessarily something that I always say about uh, other shows that are trying to be very serious and everything where it's like, you know, I appreciate I can appreciate the serious storylines they might be trying to tell, but I don't necessarily like just have fun watching them, whereas Orville, I do have fun. Well, and the ironic thing is, is that Orville is fun. I mean, it's just a fun show. And yet they take much more harsh dark decisions ultimately at the end things that we would never have gotten away with on next generation um i mean they they lose the court battle and the mm -hmm. little girl is changed into a boy that would never have happened mm -hmm. and and the episode about ab aboard the krill ship that final scene where he spares the children and yet the young woman says to him, you've created, I mean, you've made enemies. I mean, that was a chilling moment. It was, it was such a discussion of how terrorism is born. Mm. And again, not the kind of thing that I think was all that common um, on, on Star Trek. I mean, there's this light, 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 and then this gut punch at the end of that episode um, that I thought was very effective. That's a really good point. I, I want to come back to those two episodes in particular, but before we get into that too much, I want to talk about the first two episodes of the show because I watched the first episode and I, I didn't really laugh at all. I, it just didn't seem good to me really at all. And I, I was kind of like, ah, I'm not going to watch any more of this. And then I started hearing people saying who would watch some of the later episodes saying that they liked it. So that got me interested in watching more. But I'm just kind of curious if you guys thought that the first, ep particularly the first episode or two, I thought was, was really not a good way to get people into the show. Um, I don't, Robert, what do you think about that? Did you, did you feel that the first two episodes kind of were, were weaker than, than the others? I, I did. And you know, the, the, the thing that I mentioned already about uh, the sort of uh, shoehorning the jokes in uh, to scenes that didn't really need them. I thought that, that undermined them a great deal. Uh, I guess it, it also, I'll admit it took me a while to sort of uh, get used to the idea of, of the, the sort of broken relationship between um, Kelly and Mercer sort of coming back together. I thought there was some clumsiness involved with that, especially since the first episode, if I remember correctly, ends with some exposition about how she actually had planned to do that and help him get his uh, command back. I thought that was having a scene where she's sort of explaining what we just saw, I thought was a weak way just storytelling wise to end that particular episode yeah the the sniping between those two characters mm. in that first episode or two i found just really made me uncomfortable and was not fun at all for me yeah and and i also i thought that the uh the second episode with alara was a was um a good opportunity to expand that character but too much of her character arc depended on her being upset that she wasn't popular anymore I thought that that her big decision toward the end of that episode uh, was in some ways uh, influenced by just her her desire to like have the rest of the crew like her again, which I and I know that's not that's that's not entirely why she made the decision. But the way it ended up being framed, I, I just I had a, I had a problem with that. Uh, I thought they could have had her. I don't know, be a little more independent there. But uh, that's that was just that was how I interpreted it. I realize uh, that's well, that's just my opinion there. Hmm. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, I know, Melinda, you said that you really love this show. Did you love it from the first episode or did it take a couple of episodes? Know, I, to... It took a couple of episodes, but I, I come from the tradition. I mean, I work in this industry and I know how hard it is to write a pilot that's stunningly brilliant. I mean, they, they always are, are, are very tough assignment. And so I was interested enough that I was willing to give it a chance. And I think because it was giving me something I never got the opportunity to do. I mean, the first thing that went right out of a Star Trek Next Generation script was the humor. I mean, mm -hmm. immediately. That was the first thing our bosses would make us take out. And so I, I think I stuck with it because I was finding that to be very satisfying. Um, and again, I know how hard it is to write a pilot. Um, they're just very tough to do. And you're trying to introduce the world and the setup and the people uh, and there's a lot of a lot of moving pieces in play. Um, and then I think by episode, certainly by episode three and four, they had started to find their footing. Um, and it's just I thought gotten stronger and stronger with each with each episode. Um, 
So I'm, I'm quite pleased with the show, and I'm really glad they got picked up for a second season. Yeah, well, it's interesting because in these interviews I listened to with the producers, one of them mentions that Seth MacFarlane wrote the first two scripts himself before they had assembled the writer's room. And then from episode ah. three on, there was more, ah. um, you know, feedback and uh, collaboration from the whole writer's room, uh, which it seems really, really benefited the scripts as far as I can mm -hmm. tell. Oh, yeah. I mean, well, Andre and, and uh, Brandon are both very fine writers. I mean, uh, and I, I know both of them. So, um, mm. you know, it's, it's a very good staff that they've assembled. And that explains a lot. I didn't actually, mm -hmm. I should have paid more attention to who actually wrote those first two episodes. Yeah, I mean, Seth, Seth MacFarlane is actually credited as the sole writer on most of the episodes in the series. But I think, uh, you know, knowing that he actually just wrote the two first two in a vacuum without the writer's room at all, without any input, uh, does say a lot about uh, why those first two episodes do seem so different. I mean, because I agree that uh, with what you were saying, Dave, that, the you know, the first two episodes to me are clearly the two worst episodes of the show. And I was also... Um, pretty unsure about continuing with it. Uh, Christy, my wife, uh, liked it a lot more than I did. Um, and so she was uh, largely at her in, um, at her uh, enthusiasm, we were continuing with it. Um, I was more unsure. But uh, by, by the time we got to episode three about a girl, I think I was pretty into it. And, and was like, I, I, once we got to that episode, I was like, oh, it's trying to, it's trying to be like, it's trying to have like serious Star Trek plots. Uh, cause I mean, the, from the first two, it wasn't really clear what it was because, you know, it, you had this, you had this kind of weird conflict of like, well, is it, is it supposed to be really funny or is it supposed to be a space adventure show? And I wasn't really clear what they were trying to do with those two episodes. Whereas with the, starting with about a girl episode three, it seems pretty clear that like, well, what, what they really want to do is, is tell these Star Trek type, uh, uh, you know, serious plots, but then sprinkle in some humor and, 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 you know, try to put their own stamp on it to some degree. But, um, Starting with that episode, it all very much feels, you know, much more like Star Trek Next Generation in terms of like the overall scope of the plots. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I'm, I'm interested in what you said. I, I, I was looking on IMBD Pro and I, I, they do list other writers uh, having done this episode. I mean, I, I, I don't recall noticing on the screen if Seth MacFarlane is written by Seth. I don't think everything is written by Seth MacFarlane. I mean, he he does get the created by credit. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I'm curious now. I'm about ready to, you know, go download some of the episodes and just check the credits. Well, could you say, Melinda, you, you mentioned um, Brandon Braga. And I mean, because mm -hmm. he's, he's been involved in tons of star. I mean, uh, Next Generation and I think also... Voyager, um, yes. and Enterprise. I mean, he's a major. Could could you just talk about like what do you know about the the writers um, on the show? Well, I mean, I Brandon came on after I had left Trek, um, so but I was certainly familiar with his work, and I I've, I've had dinner with Andreas a few times. Um, I'm sorry, I've just blanked on his last name. Forgive me. Um, and he's a physicist, scientist turned screenwriter. Um, and so they bring to it experience on Star Trek, also in, in you know, actual science and ability to bring in things that make these stories feel a little more grounded, I think. I mean, I, I love the final episode with the planet mm -hmm. that's phasing in and out. Um, that was some very cool uh, actual science fiction that you don't see that often on television. Um, you know, I... More, I can just say they're they're very talented writers. I think they take this very seriously, and I think they've got a vehicle where they can tell not only interesting science fiction stories, but but stories about the human heart and the human heart in conflict with itself. And um, that's what I've I've truly enjoyed about it. These don't feel like they're not perfect people, and that was one of our most challenging problems on Next Generation. I mean, we were literally told. Mm. Uh, by Gene, my people are my people are perfect. They have no flaws. Well, th there's no way to write satisfying drama about people that don't have any flaws. And uh, I think the Orville gives us deeply flawed people, but 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 you're you're rooting for them. You want them to succeed. Mm. Well, could I? Uh, can I just jump in real real quick? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to say something positive about the show because I don't think I've said anything <laughs> uh, that that positive yet. One thing I I've 
I I really liked and um and and appreciated just the fact that the episodes are sort of encapsulated into um sort of their own little adventures, but they're not so encapsulated that we never hear about them ever again, which I, mm-hmm. I felt like on, on next generation and, and the old star Trek, what would often happen is it would be, and as much as I love those shows, of course, but, but what would often happen is the formula was, you know, things would get turned completely upside down. It would be, look like things were going to go crazy by the end of the episode, everything's fixed. And then it's mm-hmm. typically never referenced again. Whereas in this, in this show, um, you know, a lot of the 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 things and the the things that happen, the decisions that are made, end up having consequences throughout the rest of the season. But at the same time, you don't have to binge watch the whole thing, and you know, you don't have to watch episode two and really pay attention in order to understand what's going to happen in episode eleven, mm-hmm. which is sort of the 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 format of a lot of these sort of binge worthy shows these days. So I, I I appreciated that a lot. I thought that was a a good compromise between the two. Mm-hmm. Well, like one of the moments like that I loved was that in one episode, um, uh, what's the guy's name? Gordon gets his leg surgically removed as oh, a yeah. practical yeah, joke, yeah. <laughs> which I thought was fantastic. And then in in a subsequent episode, I think he gets stabbed in the leg or something. And he's like, "Oh, that's a new leg," and <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, just yeah. a little callback to that previous episode. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was going to say about uh, Brandon Braga. I, I don't have any professional uh, commentary on that sort, but uh, just as a fan, uh, if I if I was approaching this show with just like no knowledge of like who wrote anything or who created anything, but I knew that Brandon Braga was like an executive producer, I would have I would have bet you money that a good number of these scripts were like unused Star Trek Next Generation scripts or something <laughs> that just had never been produced because they they feel so much like them. And but then of course with the idea being that like okay, well this is supposed to be a humorous Star Trek show, uh, they would have taken those existing Star Trek scripts and then just sprinkled in some jokes or whatever. And I would have guessed that that's what Seth MacFarlane had done, that that they'd taken these uh, existing Star Trek scripts and then like Seth MacFarlane added some jokes and then, okay, poof, uh, poof, there you go. There, there's the Orville. But there's, apparently that's not what happened. So um, I think, I, but, but I mean, if you describe it that way to like a Star Trek fan, it's like, it gives you a really good sense of like what this show is like if you haven't seen it, but you have seen Star Trek. It's like, I mean, that's exactly what it's like. I mean, I actually think the show is, is mining the original series for mm-hmm. for story ideas much more so mm-hmm. than next generation um i mean if you if you look at it i can trace a lot of those episodes back to um a back to original series although mm-hmm. a bunch of people sent me messages saying oh look they tried to do measure of a man on the <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> i was like oh really um but uh, this was actually before i had started you know obsessively watching the show um but the episode with the generation ship i mean that's a direct call back to the McCoy episode. I cannot mm-hmm. remember the title for I have touched the sky, whatever. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, there he falls in love with a woman, but it's people who don't realize they're, they're living on a generation ship. So, mm-hmm. you know, that was certainly the original track. Well, I was going to say, I mean, that's a call back to Robert Heinlein's universe, which has exactly the same setup and exactly the same ending. Oh. Yeah, don't don't they even mention Heinlein or something? Or, well, the, well uh, okay. Well, it's interesting because yes. because the Heinlein story, you know, so um, John T. Campbell gave the same idea to Isaac Asimov and to Robert Heinlein, which is people who never knew that there who, who never knew that there were stars in the sky, see stars for the first time, and so um, Asimov wrote that as Nightfall, and Heinlein wrote it as Universe, and um, uh, Campbell got the idea because there was this Ralph Waldo Emerson quote about seeing the stars for the first time or something. And they actually, if I remember correctly, they, they quote, I think it's that quote that they, they, somebody quotes it literally at the end of the episode. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, so there are people writing this show who are knowledgeable about the history of the, of science fiction, which is nice because right. that's not always the case with the uh, TV science fiction. Right. And that doesn't surprise me at all, given that Seth MacFarlane, uh, I mean, even loved uh, Cosmos, and he was like the driving force behind getting that uh, that Neil deGrasse Tyson version of Cosmos on the air. Um, yes. And, you know, obviously that's science, not science fiction, but still, it's like just the fact that he knew and loved that show so much that he basically made it happen makes, you know, makes me uh, less surprised that like, oh, actually, he also loves Star Trek through and through and just like knows it inside and out. And, and that's why he wanted to make this type of uh, show dealing, you know, with with plots that actually are, are exploring a lot of these same issues in a serious way. Mm-hmm. OK, but so so I was saying that I watched the first two episodes and I was like, kind of like, yeah. 
And then the third episode that Melinda mentioned about a girl, I thought had a really interesting premise. I thought the execution was, you know, mm-hmm. I, I had a sort of mixed feelings about the execution, but I, I started getting a lot more interested in the show at that point. Um, so Robert, what did you think about, about that third episode? Did you get a little bit more interested in the show at that point or? I got more interested, I think mainly because I, I like the board character. Um, I, uh, I didn't like the trope of the, uh, courtroom drama. I, I think that that's been done a lot in Star Trek before. And, and even mm-hmm. if you were, even if it was sort of an, an homage to what has come before, I, I just didn't find it to be a very effective way of, of rendering that. But as Melinda said, you know, I was sort of prepared for it to have a, a boring, trite ending. And the fact mm-hmm. that it didn't, uh, I thought was a pretty daring uh, decision on the part of the writers. And I thought that it, um, you know, it, 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 it really sets up the relationship between Bordas and Clyden to be to be a very fraught one. And, and I, I thought that was a great decision on the part of the writers. But but, yeah, the execution, the courtroom drama, you know, oh, this alien planet just happens to have the same uh, procedures as, as an American courtroom. Uh, we just call the lawyers advocates. It's just, <laughs> I'm willing to look the other way on the everybody speaking English thing, but I just thought it, it had been done too many times. And, and for them to go to that on the third episode, I, I wasn't crazy about. Well, let's, so let's set this up for people who haven't seen the show or don't remember this episode particularly. So, um, so there's an alien on the ship named Bordas, who's uh, from a race of all male aliens. And he has a child with his partner, and the child is born female, and this is a sort of like one in a million or one in a thousand um, thing. And, and when they do it, they it's just customary that they do gender reassignment surgery and change the female baby into a male. And so um, Bordas asks the captain if uh, they can do that, and the captain says no, and it leads to this sort of cultural conflict. Uh, so, uh, so John, what do you think of this episode? Uh, yeah, no, I, I liked it. Uh, uh, I agree the execution is kind of mixed, but I, I appreciate it. It was the first episode that really made me um, give me hope for the show that it was going to be actually something interesting and, and worth uh, and worthwhile. Because, uh, you know, like I said, the first two episodes didn't really do much for me. Um, and, um, you know, I I was really impressed that they were willing to take a, to, to, to tackle like a serious issue like this and do that kind of uh, plot. And and uh, one of the things I really appreciated about the whole uh, episode is how, uh, as we've noted already, that that it doesn't really end up in this uh, traditional sort of happy ending that you would expect. Um, and I like that they left it all messy and like just the whole thing is like, you know, it throws out all of these arguments and and it doesn't come down in any in a particular way. And it's like and it's like, hey, these these people make this argument. And it's like, OK, I, that and they and they did a pretty good job of presenting that. So it's like you have to see that side of the issue. And then they bring the other side and then and then it ends up, uh, you know, um, sticking with the tradition and, and the baby becomes male. But I, I love the, the last moment of the episode where um uh, where Bordas and his partner are, are standing there with the baby and, and like Bordas has to, um, you know, uh, this, you know, he makes the decision that like, oh, I'm going to stick with my partner. I'm going to stick with this child and I'm going to love it and raise it um, and, and hope that it can be a, a, everything that it, it you know, uh, be, become whatever it wants to be. Um, and uh, even while knowing that, like, you know, he desperately wanted this child to be able to, you know, grow up as a girl. um I just I thought that they did a really good job of exploring all those different angles of this issue, which is going to be thorny, um, no matter how you look at it. And um, and I and like I said, I love that they just sort of left it messy um, instead of having like instead of like tying it up with a little bow at the end and, and like making and giving the viewer this little like note of like, oh, the good guys won. And it's like, no, instead, it's like they, they left it in this messy note. So. And there's something nice about it, too, in that. It, it it sets up these nice echoes back to the relationship between Kelly and Mercer, where Bordas and Clyden, I think I can't pronounce yeah, Clyden, it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Clyden, um there are tensions, there are issues, but they're going to work at this relationship and make mm-hmm. it make it strong and make and, and raise their child as opposed to the the human couple that you know uh, allowed themselves to be blown apart and are still working through those issues i just thought i mean that that's something you really like to see in scripts and in a show where there's these sort of echoing images and and storylines that um uh, that say something 
beyond just what the script is saying. And again, yeah, I agree. I don't think the courtroom was handled um, as well as it could have been, but I was quite surprised at the at the at the tough ending um, mm-hmm. that doesn't make you comfortable. Yeah, I completely agree with with everything you guys are saying. I thought that one of the reasons that the courtroom sequence to me wasn't as compelling is because the issue starts to become the the sort of irrational sexism of this society. Mm. And I don't think that that's actually the really interesting issue. I think the issue, the interesting issue is, do the parents have a right to make this decision? Mm. And um, what, you know, do you have the right to make someone, you know, if, if someone is going to be different from everybody else on their planet and the challenges and, you know, conflicts that that's going to cause, uh, do you have a right to sort of put for somebody into that situation, um, a child who, you know, and, and so I, I thought those sorts of uh, issues were, were much more interesting and that the sort of straw man um, sexism was, was just like not interesting because it's so obviously false. Um, yeah, no, I mean, and the other issue you have to look at is, is this child was born a, upon a, on board a union ship and granted her parents were, um, were not, union well they're union members so which state has the power here is Mm -hmm. is is it the planet um of her parents birth or is it does union law i mean to me i was thinking they were going to go to a conflicts of law argument uh between these two competing legal systems and is she a citizen of the union or is she Mm -hmm. primarily a citizen of of the home world of her parents that to me was where i would have done the argument but you know um it it still worked out. It was still an interesting episode. So, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, as I said, that's when I started feeling like, oh, maybe this show is going to be more interesting than I was expecting. And then there's also, um, Lindsay, you mentioned the Krill episode also gets into sort of really murky m- ethical territory. Um, so, so basically, in this episode, um, Ed and Gordon. Uh, infiltrate a krill ship in disguise because they're supposed to steal the sort of holy book of these aliens because military intelligence wants to analyze it. And they end up discovering that the ship is about to launch a doomsday weapon and they're going to have to blow up the ship, but the ship has a bunch of kids on board. So what are they going to do about that? And and yeah, so Melinda, as, as you mentioned, like spoiler warning, but at, at the end of the episode, basically they managed to save the kids, but they've blown up all their all the adults, all their parents. And so then uh, one of the surviving aliens says to Mercer, why did you save the kids? And he says, well, because they're not my enemy. And she says, they will be. They are now. Yeah, they will mm-hmm. be. <laughs> um, so I don't know, Robert, what do you think of that episode? Yeah, that one uh, is one of the stronger ones that, that I, I enjoyed. Um, I, uh, I I guess it was good in sort of a, an Empire Strikes Back way because it it separated the characters and put them in a very very vulnerable place. Uh, that's whenever I, I I see characters in a long running story that that where that happens to them, you really find out what they're made of and what they're capable of. So you know the friendship between the two men I think was was endearing, although the, some of the jokes went a little too far. They <laughs> they acted a little too stupid at times. Yeah, yes. there were. <laughs> Yeah, there. You know, th- that's that's that was an issue with some of the episodes where I felt that, in some cases, they they had to act stupid in order for the plot to move forward, which I didn't mm-hmm. like. But that aside, uh, I I liked the. Um, I mean, I thought it was very effective to to have the the some commentary on religion there, um, and and the the ending really really did nail it and and showed the consequences of war. I mean, even if you do something that would be recognized by almost all participants as a necessary part of war, you're still going to have these terrible, terrible consequences that, you know, you know, your enemy is, you know, might not care that you somehow rationalized this sort of action mm-hmm. to yourself. So I thought uh, exploring that was something that was very refreshing and, and needed for a show where, where people have the capability to just press a button and a, you know, a laser fires out of the ship and blows up a far away, planet or something i mean that's that's something that a show like that needs to address and this episode was the first episode where i was legitimately laughing out loud throughout mm-hmm. the episode i mean like i, I and maybe it was I, I agree with you maybe some of the stuff was a little took it a little too far but but when um 
Gordon starts talking about Avis and how he's got the gold membership <laughs> oh, to the yes. like whatever. Like I, I was cracking up at that and like yeah, maybe it's it's kinda like stretching um suspension yeah. of disbelief, but it, it was pretty funny. I mean the moment that I think this show absolutely won my heart was was I think it was episode two, I'm trying to recall exactly, but when they're they're confronted with the Krill uh captain who's threatening them and they're <laughs> threatening back. And then <laughs> Kelly and Mercer start discussing relationships. And Mercer turns to the Krill guys, don't you agree that I mean, shouldn't people well yes, I think people should have respect over their partner in a relationship. <laughs> and forgetting completely that they were supposed to be fighting each other and they were stopping to have this discussion. And I was I was falling over. I was laughing so hard. I just thought that was such a perfect moment. And and for some reason it just worked for me. Um and that's when I was like, okay, I'm totally there. Well I, I think it was that same part where he says, like, could you just move a little bit to your right? You're just it's just oh, yeah. you're framing <laughs> yeah, there. Bother. You're not framed. You know? <laughs> yeah, that was funny. And yeah, I think every, the other I... oh sorry. No, go ahead. I think the other thing about the show that, again, this is all very personal for me. I hated the holodeck. I hated the holodeck with a passion of a thousand sons. And I wanted it to, you know, they discovered it caused cancer or something and we had to get rid of it. And so the fact that they either make fun of the holodeck or they use it in the most interesting way I've ever seen in one of the episodes um, has really been balm to my soul because I, I, you know, I, I think the holodeck caused lazy storytelling and just, you know, stupid. I, I didn't like it because it was people not going to play with themselves. And and here, I mean, they, they use their version of the holodeck in, in a very funny way and then in a very serious way. Yeah, you know, every now and then, uh, like you say, like with with the with the, you know, could you move a little bit more into the frame joke? Like, there's ever every now and then there's a joke like that that just like really nails it, and uh, and and like yeah, I actually would uh, find myself just laughing out loud. Um, and I, I wish more of the jokes were like that. Uh, yeah, because like uh, there are a lot of them, like like in this in that Krill episode where it's like, oh okay, I don't know that one. I, I don't know if all of these jokes uh, really work. Um, and it's like, yeah, and like Robert was saying, it's like, you know, they're just so stupid <laughs> about how they approach everything. It's like, they're the worst spies ever. It's like, they don't, it's like, they don't know anything about how to, how to like, you know, keep a cover. Um, and it's like, uh, beyond the realm of, um, uh, believability that they, that they could have actually fooled any krill that they were actually krill. Um, you know, despite their, uh, you know, holographic disguises or whatever they had, um, you know, so so yeah, I I wish I wish that uh, uh, I, I would be more forgiving of them being su like stupid like that if, if if more of the jokes were were as funny as I I, I want them to be. But um, but you know they keep it uh, funny enough, and and every now and then they have a real a really good joke that makes it worthwhile. Like like you say, like with the uh, with the Avis one in this episode and and some of the other ones. Um, uh, and, and you know, as this as the season goes on, I think like they get more confident with the jokes. Um, there was one of the later episodes where I felt like, okay, like this is finally this episode is like peak Orville, where they finally got the plot going and the humor going both in the same episode. And I found myself laughing multiple times throughout that episode. And um, I'm hoping that 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 in season two that they you know, get more confident with both elements and are able to um, make them mesh better uh, so that it's more uh, consistent. Um, but yeah, uh, and that, that one episode yeah. was Cupid's Dagger. Uh, I think so. Yeah. Where they both fall in love with the <laughs> yeah. alien. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that episode was, uh, was fantastic. I, I, I actually watched that again because I wanted my girlfriend to watch it. And if, <laughs> if you're listening to this and you just haven't watched the show at all, you're just curious to hear what happens in it. Uh, I would recommend watching this this one episode called Cupid's Dagger, and I think it's I think it's great. And if you don't like that one, you're you're not gonna you can give up right. at that point. You're not gonna like any of the other ones. <laughs> the litmus yeah. test. Yeah, and you don't and you don't need any background really. I mean, it, it, it I think it probably preps you well enough just if you just jump in on that episode. I mean, um, I, I would almost hesitate to tell you to watch the first episode, which really lays the groundwork for this episode. But just because the first episode isn't great, but yeah, yeah, no, totally. It's it's a it's a great episode to try out if you want to just test out the show. Um, but I wanted to say when you were talking about some of the characters being stupid, I feel like this. Sh I, I wish this show was nicer to Kelly because I feel like she's just mm -hmm. constantly screwing up, and uh, I, I wish she just did something right more often. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah I agree. Well, I mean, uh, it doesn't help that they um, sort of set her off right from the start as as the the cheating woman, and and so they have all this sniping be- between uh, her and Ed. I mean, as it turns out, uh, there's a reason for that. Um, without getting into spoilers too much, but um. You know, and so that 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 sort of opens up the door to have some redemption for her character, I think, later. Um, but but yeah, I mean, I agree. Like, yeah, she's you know, as the first officer, I would expect her to be uh, maybe maybe more competent and uh, than than she appears on the show so far. Yeah, I wondered if she had like a specialty. Uh, mm-hmm. I couldn't really tell you what her. I, I don't recall if they actually set up what her specialty uh, was outside of command. Uh, I mean, Next Generation, I think Will Riker happened to just be a very good pilot. I remember that playing into the to the episode called Chain of Command. Uh, but yeah, I don't I don't recall what background she had, whether she was science or engineering mm-hmm. or whatever. I, I, I don't recall. Um, Melinda, what did you think? Of, what do you think hmm. of Kelly? Uh, you know, that that's interesting. I like her because I feel like she's. I don't see her as a screw up. I mean, the final episode, spoiler alert, um, the mistake she makes is such a human mistake. I Mm. mean, she's, she's moved by, by her humanity to act um, with, with bad results. But um, I mean, the fact that she is trying to atone for something that happened in that very first episode and to give this man that she still clearly cares about the opportunity and she believes in him. I mean, if anything, I think he's much more of, of a screw up and she's the one sort of bolstering him through the entire thing. Um, as, as chaos reigns around him, she's sort of the anchor that's holding him in place. I mean, that's how I'm interpreting her and that relationship. Interesting that you guys think she's being presented as a, as as a as a screw up. I, I think mm. that's true emotionally, but I feel like Mercer is kind of a screw up, but then he has moments where he does amazing stuff. And I feel like Kelly, I don't know, I just feel like I don't know, I just feel like the show should be nicer to her. I don't know. I thought mm. the episode though where she realizes that there's this enormously talented crew member with John mm-hmm. and she makes certain that he um that he comes to grips with his own abilities. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was all her. I mean, That's that true. was her believing in him in the same way she believes in Mercer. She just has a lot of ways that she fi- helps people find how to be the best person they are. I mean, she does that with, with, um, uh, uh security chief. Um, uh, I'm going to mispronounce her name. Alara. 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 Uh, she's clearly a role model for Alara. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, speaking of John, why don't we talk about this episode? I'm talking about John Lamar, not John Joseph Adams. Um, why don't we <laughs> yeah. talk about this episode, uh, Majority Rule, which uh-huh. is kind of like a Black Mirror episode in the middle yeah, of, totally. uh, yes. <laughs> of Orville. Um, so how about John? Since you are named John, like John Lamar, why don't you, what do you, yeah. what'd you think of this episode? Uh, I really liked it, although I, I will say... Uh, uh, speaking of the episode where um, where Kelly puts forward John Lamar as as this you know genius guy who who needs to take better uh, advantage of his potential, it's like that's a bit in contrast to his behavior in the <laughs> rule, where yes. he behaves like a complete buffoon <laughs> on an alien planet uh, and gets them into all, all sorts of trouble. Uh, but yeah, no, uh, but I uh, no, I, I definitely really like this episode. I agree, it, it it totally felt like a Black Mirror episode to me, and it was very surprising uh, to encounter that in the middle of uh the season of the orville uh which i was not just not prepared for that at all but i mean yeah and they they did a pretty good job like i mean it really felt like a black mirror episode um uh and yet also fit fit well enough in with the orville and you know because like star trek did episodes like that too where like you know they encounter some you know uh uh, alien civilization that's very much like uh, earth and and has all these uh very obvious parallels to what 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 might be going on in contemporary society and all that um but I mean, I thought this did a good good job of uh, of, of of basically uh, grappling with the whole uh, way, like you know, the internet can uh, uh, you know try and convict people and then uh, pile on them and and tear them down without really having all the all the facts and everything. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I thought I thought it was pretty well done. Yeah, and so so the premise of this episode is that each person in society has a score 
and you can up or down vote people. And if your score gets too low, you get lobotomized and turned into sort of a mindlessly cheerful person who's not going to offend anybody anymore. And I, I agree. I really enjoyed this episode. And I agree that I, this is something like you're saying, John, there were a lot of episodes of the original series that are kind of in this vein. Like I'm thinking of like the um, the episode where they end up on the planet where everybody, the whole society has been built around um, the uh, the mob book. Uh, I can't remember which oh, which book is it. A now? piece of the a-, a piece of the action. Um, which which book are from they original- all are they all reading? It's the um from original Trek. Yeah, are we talking about? Yeah, it's called a piece of the action. But, but in in the episode, there's like um uh gang gang ganglands of Chicago, 1930 to something 1925 to okay. something like that. Yeah. yeah so so, was, so, uh, so so somehow this so so this book from Earth about organized crime ended up on this uh, alien planet, and they've all it's kind of become their religion. And so the whole thing, um, the whole society resembles Chicago during prohibition or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, But, but, but just these things that from a science, from a sort of serious science fictional standpoint are not plausible at all, but make for really good stories. And I feel like, um, you know, in next generation and later Star Trek moved to a level of seriousness where you couldn't do some of these Mm -hmm. stuff, like where they end up on the Alice in Wonderland planet and stuff like that. That I kind of miss because I, I like the sort of bonkers. You know, you never know what's going to happen in this episode. What you know, they're going to beam down onto this planet and it could be freaking anything. You don't know. Yeah, actually, well, we you were desperate. Go ahead. We were we were desperate to do um, a return to a piece of the action, mm. uh, the staff, and uh, we got nixed by our bosses. But we desperately wanted because at the end, McCoy is left behind a tricorder or communicator or something. We wanted to go back, and they discover that everybody is going around wearing Spock ears or pretending to be Kirk and wearing Starfleet uniforms. Um, <laughs> it would have been really fun to write that. I mean, that epi- I love that episode, um, the Black Mirror style episode. But I, I would really like to take. Um, Brandon out to and give him a margarita because I felt like this was actually also an answer to one of the things that Gene had in his head about how crime and punishment would work um, mm. in the future. Uh, because when I was doing Measure of a Man, Gene said, well, there are no lawyers in the 24th century. And I said, well, there have to be lawyers because, I mean, there you've got crime you've got punishment you have trials you and contracts i mean you can't have functioning societies without a legal system and he said no no there is no crime because if somebody commits a crime we make their minds right hmm. which i found to be absolutely terrifying mm-hmm. um <laughs> and i wondered if brandon was reacting to that mm-hmm. sort of background that we all had on star trek by doing an episode where if you if you fail to meet societal expectations, they're mm-hmm. going to make your mind right. Well, so, oh. well did, did he uh, mean that they do some sort of neurosurgery to you yes, or did he mean? Literally, yes. No, literally that they would, you, there was a device that would make your mind right and you would no wow. longer commit crimes. Um, you would that's dark gene, Roddenberry. What the hell? <laughs> yeah, it was uh, a little creepy. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, wow. Yeah, I, I was going to say uh, about Majority Rule, like uh, the other thing about that episode that I felt uh, was kind of weird is that it, it could basically be an episode of Sliders. Like, did you guys know that show Sliders? It was like yeah, a yeah, parallel, yeah. parallel yeah. universe show. Um, it's like it, it could have it, it would actually fit better in something like that because it so feels like exactly like like 21st century, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> world today. Um that like if if you ha- if you just think of it as like a parallel universe instead, it's like it makes much more sense. But I mean, it works well enough if, if you sort of uh, just go along with it. Um, well, so. well, like earlier, Robert mentions that he would get past the everybody speaking English thing, and there was like one line that the doctor said in one. I think it was in the, in the Into the Fold episode where she says something about her translator, and that was I guess they have some. Do they have some sort of universal translator like on Star Trek? That just I don't know. That always yes. yeah yeah they threw that in there just to. I mean, and God bless them, because after watching one episode of Discovery, you know, please don't put your actors in giant costumes that they can't move in and fake teeth that they can't speak around and then have them speak a foreign language for the entire time. Yeah, that was not good. (laughs) Mm. Oh, I was going to throw in something about this episode uh, that that I pre- I this was one that I wasn't crazy about, uh, partly because you know the act the the sort of inciting incident is John mm-hmm. acting like a total jackass, uh, 
And I, actually, uh, but talking about we, what we mentioned earlier about Kelly, I actually thought this was a decent episode for Kelly. She does stick around the planet and do her. She does her best to save John without violating the prime directive, without just going in there and shooting up the place. So she, I, I thought this was an episode that that did right by her. Uh, one other thing I also I, I appreciated and compared with with uh, Star Trek Next Generation is that they gave the uh, the young lady from the planet, I forget her name, uh, but they gave her a chance to sort of explain why her society did things this way. And very often in some of these shows, not just Star Trek, but others, when they have an alien try to explain why they do things, it very often it very often is meant to make them look foolish or, or narrow minded or insular in some way. And they at least gave the, the woman a chance to explain why their society did things without the implication being that, oh, look how look how stupid she is. These people don't understand. Do you remember what she, what, like, what exact or could you expand on what she said? I don't remember exactly. She was just giving a, a talk about how her way of doing things um, is is a true democracy. And she sort of scoffed mm. at the idea that you could ever really trust elected representatives to speak for mm-hmm. a society when when things are that complicated. And granted, like it's. <laughs> You know, it, it, in both cases, you're making a sweeping generalization about how to run a society. But again, they 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 showed some respect for that character when they could have easily just made her out to be the other who just doesn't mm-hmm. get it. And and the humans are here to enlighten these poor people. I think that's been done too many times. And I, I thought that it, that was a refreshing uh, change of pace for the show. And that's really interesting. I, I, that kind of makes me wish more of the episode had been about exploring that you know, the, the benefits of direct democracy versus representative democracy or something. Cause that's the stuff I think is really interesting, but uh, I'm not in the, I'm probably in the minority on that, but. <laughs> yeah. I think one of the places they could have gone with that would, was, uh, you know, one of the people from the Orville could have said like, well, yeah, direct democracy could work if you assume that everybody is equal uh, and that there are no like historical disadvantages that would, you know, mess things up for certain segments of society. Uh, maybe, maybe they could have go- expanded from there. But of course, then at that point, you run and just turning the, the show into a debate, which obviously mm-hmm. you can't really do when, you know, in, in an hour long science fiction action show. Yeah, because I do feel like a lot of these episodes, I wish that they were a little longer. I mean, and I don't, I don't usually feel that way about TV shows, but I, I feel like, like particularly um, the last episode, Mad Idolatry, that Melinda mentioned, where the premise basically is that it's actually it's really funny. But but so the premise basically is that Kelly violates the Prime Directive, and then they're going to try to sort of sweep it under the rug. But then it turns out that this planet, uh, you know, jumps seven hundred years into the future every eleven days or something, and so uh, eleven days later, the entire planet's religion is based on something Kelly did. So it's impossible to sweep it under the rug at that point Mm -hmm. um but uh, you know it it was but i was watching and i was like oh this is really good but they're gonna have to wrap this up in like the next eight minutes uh (laughs) i wish there was like 20 more minutes or something of this because it was getting going kind of interesting places yeah i would like to have seen what isaac did i mean Mm -hmm. i wish there had been time to have scenes of isaac during that 11 day 700 year interval and that was uh clearly they didn't have time for that yeah, so just to explain that, so the the robot character on the show just decides to live through one of these seven hundred year um, periods to try to, and I thought this was actually interesting to try to fix the damage that Kelly had done, and then it turns out that actually that was unnecessary, as it turns out, because mm-hmm. uh, as the show posits it, the these sort of religious um, fundamental extremism, sort of uh, you know inqu- Inquisition type period, is just. An, ine- an inevitable mm. step in the progress of human civilization of any, I guess, intelligent civilizations. And, uh, and that was, again, it was a, a sort of interestingly, uh, sort of more intelligent and nuanced and thoughtful than, than I think you, you would necessarily expect uh, the show to be just from watching the promo ads and stuff for it. Yeah. I hope they go back to uh, the, the implications of this episode because like, I mean, you know, if that society advances 700 years, like whatever, what every 11 days in in our universe, like in the next 11 days, like they're going to be 700 years farther in the future. And they're already like they've already basically surpassed uh, the union at this point when they encounter them at the last moments of the episode. So I'm like, um, 
what's what's going to happen in 11 days i mean you know are are they going to are they going to uh, realize like okay well now there's this portal that we can go to this other universe we can like uh go uh, like you know if if bad stuff happens in those 700 years they could just come back and try to conquer the whole universe and what the heck would 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 our universe be able to do against this uh super super advanced society um so I hope they don't just sweep that under the rug uh, uh, and, and they actually uh, revisit that and, and have some answer to what might uh, come of that. Um, I mean, it seems like what we last saw of them, that they're beneficial. Um, but, you know, such regimes don't always last forever. Well, no, so. but, but you would think that you would start to very quickly get into first strike kind of logic, right? That we have to yeah, take them yeah. out now because otherwise we'll be helpless mm-hmm. before them in 11 days or 22 days or 33 days or whatever it is, you know? Mm hmm. I thought the episode was uh, maybe trying too hard, but 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 def- definitely trying to uh, to just show how enlightened uh, the people had become, so that maybe that wouldn't be as big of a concern. Although I mm-hmm. guess I'm still concerned, but I'm I'm trapped in mm-hmm. 21st century paranoid mentality, so right. I'm not I'm not a man of the future that George uh, Gene Roddenberry was hoping for. I suppose <laughs> I, I would say this though. Uh, I uh, that that one was my favorite. I'm I'm sorry. I guess we're skipping ahead talking about that one, but I can't resist now because it uh, the the word that I wrote in my notes was Sagan esque because mm. it it just felt mm-hmm. like uh, you know the the sort of um, the hopeful future that we're that we're supposedly striving for. We hope we're mm-hmm. striving. For. And also, uh, I thought it critiqued religion in a in a smart way where it wasn't just saying religion stupid it was although you know if you catch me on a bad day you, you might hear me say that but but uh, <laughs> but it, it was uh it was trying to say like look that those supernatural truth claims and things like that that is part of a society asking the big questions and we need to work those things out mm-hmm. so it wasn't a you know disrespectful simple dismissal of any of that it, it was it was a very it was a it was a nice sympathetic uh and and nuanced uh understanding of it i i really appreciated that yeah, I also really like the fact that the show takes kind of a rationalist view because that's I'm an atheist. That's mm-hmm. really important to me. And um, I think <laughs> <Ditto>. it, <laughs> Same here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think it is important to have. I mean, one of the things that I think is good about science fiction is that it does. It is sort of honest about how religions develop, which is that people believe that you know people have experiences and misunderstand them and then the story grows with the telling. And then, you know, you, you see this in, in science fiction over and over again, where you, you, the characters come across a religion and we, the audience know how it came about. It's because of the, you know, this, it's actually a generation ship or, you know, it's because the, they saw this advanced technology hundreds of years ago or things. And I think just the more narratives there are about how that are sort of mm-hmm. straightforward about the man-made or human constructed nature of religion, I just think that's an important message to be out there in the world. Mm. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. We need explanation for why there's thunder and lightning. So we make up stories mm-hmm. and then the stories become more complicated and then we start killing each other about them, which is yeah, depressing. And, yeah. And hopefully a show like the Orville, which as you noted, uh, you know, uh, is explicitly designed to try to get the non-science fiction fans to, to actually watch the show. Um, hopefully that uh, by exploring that kind of thing seriously on this show, you know, it'll, it'll, you know, educate more people into the, the possibilities that like, Hey, like maybe, maybe religion isn't as, uh, as a mystical thing as you think it is that it's actually just this, uh, you know, human created thing. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's like with any kind of issue story, you, you hope that you can, if you tell the story, you can, uh, reach those people who it needs to reach in order to convince them that maybe that their thought process is wrong on that issue. Um, of course, the problem is that most of the time, the people who disagree with an issue aren't going to read those stories. Um, so uh, in a case like this, which is a very general interest science fiction adventure show, uh, one that's at least ostensibly, um, at least partially intended to be a comedy, uh, you know, maybe you can sort of... Uh, uh, get those people who um, wouldn't tune in if they knew that the thing was about like issues or whatever, but then, you know, you um, trick them into enjoying an episode and then have them think about it afterward. There's something nicely subversive yeah, about the, about the way the show is doing that. I mean, I was thinking about the fact that they have so many different aliens on board that they never ever refer to it. I mean, it's just not a big deal. 
It's mm-hmm. like everybody's just going on about their business, whether it's the guy who keeps meeting up with them in the elevator. Oh, God, was- <laughs> <laughs> I mean, which was great. And and I love Yapit. I mean, I just he cracks me up. Um, you know, the the jelly blob just wandering around the ship and he's an engineering and apparently he's really good at it. Mm-hmm. And and nobody makes um nobody's I mean, they on Star Trek they had to do that with Spock. I mean, that was sort of a whole new idea, I think. And 66 or 64 or whenever it first came on and now it's just like yeah we have all these aliens on the ship and we've got a society that's all male so we have two men who are a couple and you know uh, it's just they they don't make a big deal out of any of it which i think is is one of its strengths yeah i thought that yafit had one of the best lines in the whole series where he's trying to sweet talk the doctor and he says you're smart and you're beautiful and you're such a good mother to those awful kids <laughs> um but yeah but I, I agree with you that um you know and also that like with the alien that they keep meeting in the elevator just the fact that it's so mm-hmm. mundane that you know the, the the sort of boring guy who talks your ear off in the elevator is an alien and it's, it's just <laughs> you know you don't even really think about it um and and that yafit i mean this the special effects for yafit are fairly good for a tv show and mm-hmm. Um, I was listening to one of the producers say that, you know, that it's gotten to the point where the, you know, they can do the special effects cheaply enough that you can do a show like this, um, you know, as a network TV show where you could never have done a a sort of mm-hmm. science fiction comedy show with with these sorts of production values, uh, you know, in the 90s, you know. I, right. I found the attempts on the part of some of the human characters to learn about other cultures to be. Of course, clumsy and and mm-hmm. potentially insensitive, but also kind of sweet and uh, genuine. You know, I mean, the part where uh, Captain Mercer goes to Bordas and Clyden's uh, quarters and says, "Hey, why don't we try one of your games? I want to learn." <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> that that was probably my yeah. biggest laugh for the for the whole show. I thought that was very well done and and uh, you know showed the sort of good good natured. Attempts to learn about other people's cultures, the, the, mm-hmm. you know, in in a in this context in which people just take for granted that there's going to be people from all over uh, on this ship and making it work. So yeah, I jumped out of my chair at the the hot potato <laughs> kind of game, but I was actually oh, that was hilarious. Yeah, I was I was actually kind of surprised in the um the episode we were talking about earlier about a girl. I was actually kind of surprised that the that um Ed and Kelly showed so little. Um, re- mm-hmm. like regard. I don't know what the word would be. It's so, so little, you know, they were just like, no, um, uh, the Mocklin culture is wrong. You know, what's wrong with you? You yeah. know, th- there was no kind right. of like cultural sensitivity really at all. Mm-hmm. Even, even if, you know, even if you think the culture is wrong, I was just surprised at how, you know, just lacking in tact and diplomacy they, right. they would be. But I think that, I, I wonder if that's an issue of that being one of the earlier episodes as opposed to one of the later ones. You know what I mean? Cause we were, I wonder how much that that sort of thing evolved. I could be wrong about that. I'm making an assumption, but I, I got the impression that it improved throughout the show. Uh, whereas I, that that episode was very clumsy about it. Right. Yeah. I think I think it was more like a um, a failure to execute properly, where they were basically trying to set them up at the front at the start of the episode to be on the wrong side of the issue, and then to uh, by the end of the episode to see them come around. So that it's like so that the that that the audience would basically be with them, where like they might be initially rec- recoiling at the idea, uh, but then by the end of the episode you come around, uh, and I think that was maybe in a clumsy attempt to try to do that. Um, that's how I saw it. I mean, I agree that it it it, it was a bit off putting at first because like oh well, uh, shouldn't you shouldn't you be <laughs> shouldn't you be uh, willing to listen to this culture's uh, norms uh, since it's it is a thing, but. Um, yeah, it's uh, yeah. I think it was a more of a clumsy execution rather than trying to um, say too much about them um, as characters, uh, and just to show some little growth for for them over the course of that episode. I can I can see that. I think that's fair to some degree, but I, I also think that Kelly's reaction was utterly believable because what's the message? You know, mm-hmm. being a girl is means you're abnormal you're damaged Mm -hmm. you must be changed i mean um there was a lot more going on in that episode than just cultural sensitivity i mean Mm -hmm, i think mm -hmm. it was a question about especially in this era of me too um Mm -hmm. i i think they were trying to make a broader point um and and were courageous enough to have them lose um 
but uh, yeah, I, I I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure I totally agree with that because I do think the the underlying message of femaleness meaning that you are damaged or you are unnatural um, mm -hmm. is is something that we should be facing head on. Um, Sorry, <laughs> don't mean to sort of lay all that estrogen on you here. But, you know, <laughs> um, I no, no, I think that's well put. I don't I don't have anything really to add to that. Um, but I did want to ask you, Melinda, you mentioned earlier that there was an episode where you thought that they handled the holodeck um, concept as as well right. as you'd ever seen. Could you talk more about that? That was the episode, again, spoilers for any listeners, um, where Alara uh, feels that she's failed in her job and is trying to test herself and push herself. And, and you don't, at first you just think, why are there clowns and all these bizarre things on mm -hmm. the ship? And then you realize that it was a program she's running on their version of the holodeck to force herself to test herself um, and to, to, allow her to see that she is capable and she can do this. Um, and, and to me, using the holodeck as a training exercise made a lot more sense than, you know, people going off pretending to be Sherlock Holmes or, you mm -hmm. know, some hard boiled detective. Um, and I also just loved the uh, cold opening of one of the episodes where they're doing an old Western <laughs> And, uh, and Gordon and Mercer are supposedly going to do some sort of big, you know, um, kind of shoot out at the OK Corral thing. And then it just goes completely off the rail. That's mm. the one where I was laughing out loud through the entire setup of of um, where their, you know, their their opponent starts a dance dance off contest. Mm -hmm. And Gordon's like, well, I was just trying to change it up a little, you know, give it a little different feel. I thought that was wonderful. Um, and I like the fact that it was a whole bunch of people who are on the crew doing this together. I mean, one of the things I really missed from original Trek was those moments in their rec room where Uhura would be singing and Spock would be playing the harp and Sulu would be showing off his rapier. And like that, that sounds bad, but, uh, anyway, literally he was a swordsman <laughs> and, um, uh, there was a sense of family, a sense of camaraderie, and I always felt like both Tin Forward and the holodeck felt like they were isolating mm. um, rather than something, you know, creating community. And the truth is that people on long voyages, you would think that being forced into confining situations, they wouldn't want to be together. But that's actually that they've discovered that that's the opposite effect. People on, you know, long freighter voyages or submarines, they actually do crave that that contact with other people. Um, so I, I've liked what they've done with the holodeck a lot in the Orville. Well, let me say, because I, I thought it was interesting that we di we discover at the end of this episode that it's apparently not that big of a deal for them to, um, or maybe, I guess maybe it is now that I think about it, but it's, it's at least, you know, a thing that the technology is, is straightforward to put yourself into a simulation and erase your memory that you've put yourself into a mm -hmm. simulation so that you don't know that you're in a simulation. And this gets into the kind of like, um, for me, it's Philip K. Dick, um, Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldritch, but also, or, um, <laughs> you know, it could be um, uh, Inception or kind of, so, you know, the, the, the idea of the, mm. that once you're in a simulation, once you're in a dream that you don't know is a dream, from then on, aren't you always wondering if you're still in the dream? Like every time you're uh, infiltrating a Krill ship in the future, are you wondering, wait, is this a simulation that I've put myself into? Is any of this mm -hmm. real? You know? Oh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. Uh, John, what'd you think of that episode, Firestorm, with the clown? Uh, right. Yeah. No, I thought it was interesting. I, I, I like, I like the way it resolves. Uh, I mean, there's, there were moments where I was a little unsure about the overall execution of that particular episode, but, um, I think that was also one that had, uh, some good jokes in it, even though the overall plot is sort of more of a, like, weird, scary plot, you know, since she's, like, like, testing herself and seeing all the weird clowns and things like that. Um, but, uh. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought I, I agree. I thought that the use of the holodeck was pretty interesting, and and the whole uh, erasing a memory thing was was pretty cool. Um, although, like like you say, uh, br brings up some uh, uh, interesting implications for what you know you might be able to do with that in the future on the show. Um, but uh, yeah, it would be kind of cool if uh, like uh, if, if 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 in a future episode, if they just sort of call back to that subtly by by having her question, like you say, uh, whether or not what's happening is actually real. Cause it's like, it seems like it would be 
uh, very easy for it, for that to be something that um, uh, haunts a person. Mm -hmm. um, that that episode it was reminds me a lot of this next generation episode where Beverly Crusher is wandering around the ship and people keep disappearing and once someone's disappeared nobody else on the ship has any memory that they ever existed and it gets to this mm. ridiculous point at the end of the episode where it's just like her and John Luke Picard and you know it, as far as he knows they've always been it's always been just the two of them on the ship to, mm -hmm. you know um and that's that was just a really memorable creepy episode for me and uh and particularly toward the end of Firestorm it was really reminding me of that mm -hmm. Yeah, did you did you like the uh, the sort of alien homage too? Because there was a scene where she's walking around uh, exhausted and sweaty with a with a gun, and oh, yeah, the yeah, yeah. computer is saying that the ship's going to blow up soon. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh. Well, I guess John. I mean, John, you've haven't you watched every episode of Next Generation three or four times or something? Uh, I don't know, if three or four times. I've definitely seen them all more than one time. Um, so yeah, probably at least three times I would guess I'd probably seen all of them or at least most of them. Uh, some of them are so bad that I couldn't <laughs> bring myself to watch them again, you know. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I know what they are at least. Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, I guess it's, 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 is every episode of this some sort of homage, or is there anything in here that you guys think is oh. is sort of going? I guess. Well, I don't. I don't know, Moons. What do you think? Do you think that? Um, or were you watching all these episodes and saying, oh, I, I recognize this from Next Generation, I recognize this from Next Generation, and this from the original series? Or were there any where well, you're... I, I, I have a confession to make. I've never watched another episode of Next Generation or Voyager or Deep Space Nine or Enterprise after I left the show. <laughs> um, I was so burnt out, truthfully, that I have never seen a single episode. Um, so I cannot speak to that. Uh, for me, because I grew up as a kid on original Trek, I see more of the callbacks to the original show mm -hmm. than I do to uh, Next Generation. So I have to defer to John on this one. I mm -hmm. I have no idea because I don't know what episodes they did. I think I think most of the not most, but there were quite a few episodes that that reminded me very strongly of episodes from Next Generation. I think the undercover Krill episode reminded me mm -hmm. of when uh, Picard and Data fly undercover with the um, Klingons into Romulan space. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, I remember the Klingon in that episode saying, if the Romulans find us, it means death for us all. Mm -hmm. um, now, I think what else? Um, uh, the, you know, now it's slipping my mind. I, that's why I think I like the episode 12 the most in this one, because I thought that was the the most original mm -hmm. of these. Um, yeah, I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll leave. Oh, can I throw in one more thing about this episode with the. Uh, Sorry, sorry to derail a little yeah, bit no, go, 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 go. about the the episode with Alara. I thought it did it did a lot more justice by Alara in this case rather than episode two, which I thought you know didn't treat her as well as it could have. Um, mm -hmm. I also th by that episode, and I think that's episode ten. Um, we, you know, in in that case, uh, I, I had a couple of things that that reminded me of Next Generation. One of them is the fact that as soon as someone died, and I think in this case it's the 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 doctor's assistant. Yeah, yeah, nurse. Parker. As soon as someone was murdered, I was like, mm -hmm. okay, all this is an illusion yeah, because I know right. we're, there's no way we're going. We're no, they were doing this. Um, mm -hmm. But also by episode ten of the show, there have now been in almost every single episode um, a scene where someone does something dangerous in direct violation of their orders, mm -hmm. and I thought when when the uh, at the very end of the episode where the character is sitting around and uh, you know she's sort of getting reprimanded, I thought like, okay, are we now going to see a serious consequence to someone disobeying an order? And it didn't happen, and I was mm -hmm. a little I was a little disappointed in that because one one of my I'm I'm one of the defenders of Star Trek three, and hmm. I like that one because there are real consequences to Kirk uh, uh, disobeying orders. Um, but anyway, yeah, you were talking about how this parallels with the other shows, so maybe I should go back to that. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you know, I mean, I I don't uh, I don't necessarily see a one to one comparison on every single thing. Um, I'm sure if I uh, I mean, even even though I you know I feel like I should have them all memorized at this point, having seen them so many times. Uh, I mean, there's certainly um, there's certainly things that remind me of episodes. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I wouldn't say that there's a direct parallel for each one. That that's like a clear homage. Um, it, it feels more to me like uh, 
like the sort of thing that that someone who is a big fan of of of, their, of various Star Treks would write. It's like it's like very much in line with all of the different Star Trek series, um, you know, without being something that's trying explicitly to call back to this or that. Uh, just sort of like it's almost just like distilling all of Star Trek knowledge uh, in or throwing it all into a blender and then like pouring out a smoothie of uh, of a new <laughs> show or whatever. Um, you know what I mean? It's like, it, it, this is what kind of feels like it. it, it uh, um, so it's like obvious love for, for Star Trek uh, is at the basis. And then th just trying to tell stories that would live up to that, but with their, you know, with their specific spin of being, you know, a sort of more lighthearted version of it or whatever. Well, let, let me go back then again to this episode, Cupid's Dagger, which, as I said, I think is by far the best episode in terms of the humor and I think, as you said, the plot working together. Um, and I think the only the only um, down uh, sort of uh, liability or whatever of this episode would be that it doesn't have any um, sort of big concept idea that some of the other ones genuinely do mm -hmm. so I, I think but i think this is to me this this episode shows what the potential of the orville is this is this is like the most orville to my mind mm -hmm. episode um and if you could just have more episodes that had this level of being genuinely funny and having plots that genuinely worked and then also had like like for example so there's this episode new dimensions where they go into the two-dimensional pocket mm -hmm. universe which i felt was they really underutilized the two-dimensional um, you know, it, it was just sort of like a, you know, sort of a, I don't know, kind of a dangerous um, parallel universe that they were in that they needed a shield to protect themselves from. But the fact that it was two dimensions never played a huge role in the story. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But so if you could take an idea like that, that's interesting, and then mm -hmm. have it be firing on all cylinders with the other stuff, the way that Cupid's Dagger does. Um, yeah. That's, that's, I think, the where they should really be aiming to to take this show. Yeah, I agree. Uh, uh, and, uh, I, you know, actually, one one thing about um, Cupid's Dagger that uh, sort of brings to a head uh, one of the other things that astonished me about the show is that so like Derulio is played by Rob Lowe. And it's like, oh, wow, that's <laughs> Rob Lowe. Like how how'd they get how they get somebody like him to be on the show as a guest star. But then like they also had Charlize Theron as a guest star and Liam Neeson. Like what? Mm -hmm. Like what is this Seth MacFarlane? Like best friends with like everybody in Hollywood or something like how did he get these like hugely famous people to be guest stars I, I think I pretty think much he, he's, he is yeah pretty much he's yeah. friends with everybody yeah, and, yeah, yeah and what a great chance to be in a science fiction show and yeah. and I mean how often do these people get this kind of offer you know I mean um and to go play with your friends that's the feeling I get off this show all the time is that this is done with so much love and it comes across and and I think that's why it's working so well yeah, Rob Lowe was excellent in this episode. Oh my God, he was yeah. really oh, he perfect was for it. Yeah. They, they what, a, what a gem to to find him for this. Uh, but I mean, he, I he reminded we... me a lot of the character he played in uh, Tommy Boy, uh, <laughs> and, although not as evil, of course, but definitely sort of smarmy and passive aggressive, and, and uh, very well done. I think we can all agree, though, that Rob Lowe doesn't need any kind of alien pheromones to get people to be like super attracted to him, though, right? I mean, come on. <laughs> He looked good even in the in the blue scales. I know, yeah. even in I'll, the blue I'll, scales, I'll yeah. yeah, yeah. Even when his, you know, the head's exploding, it was, <laughs> it was good. You know? um, I, I think the other thing, too, I truly do like about the show is they do have big concepts, but they always, for the most part, seem to bring everything down to a very small personal level. And uh, I think that's, I think that's a good thing. I mean, I'm, I'm so tired of, of movies. I mean, to me, television is where the most interesting stories are being told now. Um, I'm so tired of things in which, you mm. know, the entire earth will be destroyed or the universe will be destroyed. And, and here, oftentimes these things come back to, you know, a young woman's ability to recognize that she's capable and competent and she can do this. And, you know, there's something nice about that, that it, that it comes comes back to to those moments. I mean, because even in Cupid's Dagger, the, the threat is the offstage big threat is so secondary to everything mm -hmm. else that's happening. And um, I, I just uh, I, I like that about the show a great deal. Let me just say before we run out of time, too, that I don't think we've really talked too much about um, the character, Dr. Claire Finn, who's played by Penny mm. Johnson Gerald. And I just want to say, she just seems to be a fantastic actress to me. Yes. And oh, yes. Um, just like, just elevates the material in terms of its drama, uh, sort of dramatic 
impact so much in, mm-hmm. in so many of these scenes beyond what I think just sort of, uh, you know, any, any, any other actor would be would be doing. Yeah. And when she got her moment in, uh, I believe this is in the fold, correct? When, yes. When, mm-hmm. Yeah. In the fold. Um, she was just tremendous. She was she was fierce and also uh, nurturing. I mean, all of these things. She's she's great. Um, and I'm really glad to see her get to have some some real moments here um as opposed to when she was on castle where i don't have to mm-hmm. have much sense of her at all um and now i can see what a talented actress she is mm-hmm. yeah i think and in, in, in that episode also um i i felt like isaac really uh uh emerged as as a as a great character as well and like a, a, with mm-hmm. data being like my favorite star trek character uh yes. obviously like I, isaac is is a character i was interested in to see where what they would do with him and in that episode i thought they did a really good job of like having him uh sort of fill that data role in an interesting way that like i would like to see explored more on the show uh, i mean he's great in metadology too like that that was really cool but i mean he's more of a solution to the problem rather than it really being about him um so yeah i i i like the character i have to say the first time i watched the episode i would have sworn it was brent doing <laughs> the voice yeah. I, mean, oh, I, yeah. I was i had to go look because i was like is this brent <laughs> um mm-hmm. and no it wasn't uh but but he's channeling data beautifully mm-hmm. and, and yes data was the most interesting character in next generation so yeah <laughs> i i felt that up until that episode uh they were using isaac a little too often as an exposition machine mm-hmm. uh and so to give him an opportunity to actually bond with people and have a connection uh with them was was great uh, I liked uh, the very end, w- the moment he has with with Doctor Finn, where he says something like, "Your children are unruly and disrespectful, and I'm quite fond of them." So I, I thought that was, and that that sounded like the way he would phrase it to it. It it sounded right. It was a nice moment. Uh, I that's probably those two that episode and episode twelve were were my the ones that I I, I enjoyed most. Yeah, I think it's interesting how positive this whole conversation has been because i would i would have said that for me the show is you know like a lot of the jokes don't land a lot of the um premises i'm kind of like oh i feel like i saw this done better in a star trek episode Mm -hmm. or whatever but yeah there's there's obviously something about this show that's bringing out a sort of fun conversation about it more so than i I was necessarily expecting i thought it was interesting that one other thing i want to mention is that the um critics score on Rotten Tomatoes for this show is 21% and the audience and the audience score is 93%. All right, audience, <laughs> go audience. <laughs> and I, wow, that's crazy. Yeah. And I don't know. It's, it's just one of the biggest divergences between the critics opinion and the audience opinion I've ever seen. Yeah. Just to tell you where I'm, I, I thought I'm really only into maybe three episodes of, of out mm-hmm. of the 12. So I, I think I'm definitely more toward the negative side, although I, you know, I didn't want to be the, the curmudgeon mm-hmm. and it's, it's interesting to talk with other people who are into science fiction and, and sort of talk about just the storytelling techniques of the show and whatever. Uh, we probably could have had a whole conversation about the uh, just, just about the originality alone and how, you know, the, the issue of where it is in terms of, you know, uh, its relationship mm-hmm. with Star Trek. Uh, we also didn't touch on uh, too much on on Seth MacFarlane's performance, which I I, I had a problem with his character probably the most, uh, you know, because mm-hmm. he sort of ricochets from the bumbling mediocre guy to Captain Kirk, mm-hmm. and it it just was I got I was getting whiplash from it. Uh, but yeah, sorry, I, I don't want again I don't want to hijack, hijack things with that. But uh, yeah, this has been a positive conversation. But I think it's because we're we're nice people. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you obviously know, you didn't I... listen to our Dark Tower panel. <laughs> oh boy. Uh you know what's funny though is like I, I was actually thinking as we were wrapping things up that uh it's weird. Like I don't know that I've ever had this thought, but like I feel like I actually like the show more after this conversation. Um and, and, and I mean I do actually have a lot of issues with the show. I, I wish it was better in in its execution in a lot of ways. There's a there's a you know, I could nitpick every single episode, uh basically. Um but and, and but I mean, like I was saying on our discovery panel, like I mean, if you held up this first season compared to any other first season of a Star Trek show, I mean, it would compare pretty favorably. I mean, a lot of those first seasons of of the various Trek shows are pretty uneven. And maybe I'm just incredibly forgiving, um, and I am for the most part, because I know how hard it is to do this. 
because this is I do it, you know, and I and and the terror when you start to make a show um, mm-hmm. is everything going to work out? Um, your cast, your 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 crew, the editing staff, your directors you bring in. I mean, there's so many ephemerals to making magic on television uh, that I'm willing to to cut quite a bit of slack and. Uh, and this show just delights me. I, yes, I know. I see all of the problems and I don't care because mm-hmm. it makes me happy. And I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with that in this day and age right now. Well, actually, yeah, let me say, because I want to pick up on what Robert was saying about Seth, Seth MacFarlane's performance and things, because, yeah, I'm kind of like on the fence about his character. He's kind of like immature and sort of mm-hmm. uh, self-absorbed and stuff. And I know he's he's supposed to be, but... Um, it doesn't make me love him particularly, but I was just really surprised at how much I loved his character in the um, uh, Cupid's Dagger episode when he's in mm-hmm. love and he's just smiling all mm-hmm. the time and just ebullient and happy. And mm-hmm. I just wish he was more like that all the time because I, I just I, <laughs> I just had a big smile on my face, you know, just watching him <laughs> through that whole episode. Well, and I think as an actor, he's being enormously generous. He's really playing the straight man to everybody else. I mean, he's letting everybody else um, play off of him and off of his self-absorption and all of these things um, and is willing to play a character that that isn't the nicest um, or or the most interesting person. Um, And that kind of generosity is rare in a star. So I, I have to give him props for that. Yeah, but just definitely agree with what John was saying, that I'm glad that there's going to be a season two of this show. And uh, I think that, you know, hopefully they can sort of just start fixing more and more of the things that are kind of not quite working about this. And, um, you know, and just keep doing those really interesting science fiction ideas and just making everything just sort of fit together better. And I think the show could really, uh, really, really be something special um, in season two. Um, but yeah, so we're pretty much out of time. Anyone have any, any other final thoughts they want to throw in here at the end? <laughs> nope. I think I'm just not at all. I think we're good. That you guys all. just ended on such a great note that I, I did not want to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, great. So yes, I'll just end, end that, end it on that note there that we're looking forward to season two. And so we've been speaking with John Joseph Adams, Melinda Snodgrass, and Robert Rapino. So, guys, thank you so much for joining us. Good to be here. Thank you. Thanks, gentlemen. It was fun. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to John Joseph Adams, Melinda Snodgrass, and Robert Rapino for joining us on the show. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time or fixed monthly contribution, you can do that via PayPal over at geekskyshow.com slash crowdfunding. Normally at this point, I thank everyone who signed up in the past week to support us on Patreon or PayPal, but due to Wired's holiday schedule, I'm having to record this episode a week early. So for me, the last week of December is still in the distant future. So to any future supporters who may exist, I just want to say, greetings, future people. This is a message from your past. Thank you so much for your support. I hope there are a lot of you, and I'll plan to thank you all when Geek's Guide to the Galaxy returns in 2018. And, of course, I also want to thank Michael Marisi for sponsoring today's show. Learn more about his new book, Black Star Renegades, over at michaelpmarisi.com. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next year. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show... Visit GeeksGuideShow.com. To learn more about your host, visit DavidBarrKirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.